Hello, my name is Steve Gratton. I'm a plant water relations specialist here at UC Davis, and I'm here to talk about managing salinity in tree crop production. First, I want to talk about the main sources of salt. There's a number of places where salts can, can come from uh, that get into the crop root zone. It can either be from the mineralization of soils, which is a small contributor. Uh, the largest contributor is, is the source of the irrigation water. Uh, there's a, a small area in, in coastal regions can actually get salt deposition that lands on the, directly on the leaves that can produce injury. Fertilizers are another source of salts, even though they're nitrogen and, and potassium and other types of, of, of minerals, uh, they can still contribute to the salinization of soils. And also there's manures and compost. These are also uh, contribute to, to, to the overall salinity in the soil profile. So collectively, all these four, uh, five sources of, of salts can contribute to the salinity of the, of the root zone. Now, once the salts get into the, the irrigation water, the soil water, they dissolve into to ions. They either dissolve into uh, cations, and the most common salinizing cations are sodium, calcium, and magnesium, or, uh, and they also dissolve into anions, which is chloride, sulfate, and bicarbonate. Now, these are the, the main uh, salinizing ions. Now, what varies is the concentration of these constituents as well as the ratio of the different constituents. Now, there's also small amounts of irrigation water contains boron, but boron, uh, the reason why it's listed here is not really a salt contributor because the concentration is substantially less, but nevertheless, there's a small window where uh, the concentration is either deficient for the for plant growth or it's toxic. Uh, carbonate generally is not a problem in a lot of irrigation waters, mainly because the pH of the, of the water is, is, is low enough such that it's not a major constituent. Nitrates, of course, can be also another contributor, uh, but again, that's you know, isolated in, into specific cases, particularly uh, recycled wastewaters. And potassium, again, can be a high contributor in, in certain um, uh, agricultural industry uh, effluents. Now I want to talk about the difference between both salinity and sedicity. Now they're, they're different. Now salinity is a condition where the salt concentration is high enough to reduce crop yields across crop quality. And if you look at the uh, crop water quality report, there is a, usually a, a parameter and they're called electrical con conductivity, uh, specific conductance or some term like that, and the units there are in decisiemens per meter. Now, sedicity is a little different than salinity. Sedicity is a condition where the types of salts in the system is dominated by sodium salts as opposed to calcium and magnesium salts. And um, so the problem with this is that when you have high sodium relative to calcium and magnesium, it tends to cause soil aggregates to, 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 to break apart. And when that happens, you have problems with soil structure, aeration, water infiltration, and overall plant health. In other words, this, you can have things like a sodium-induced calcium deficiency. Now, the, the term that, that the water quality parameter that, that is associated with sedicity is called SAR, or the sodium adsorption ratio. It's basically the ratio of sodium over the square root of the calcium plus magnesium. Now, that's somewhat similar to, to the exchangeable sodium percentage. That's more of the soil term for sedicity. That deals with the percentage of sodium saturated, uh, uh, occupying the, the cation exchange capacity of the soil. Now, it's important also to talk about is the different types of salinity. Um, there's electrical conductivity can be that of the irrigation water, or electrical conductivity can be that, that of the saturated soil paste. Now, electrical conductivity is the term we use to describe uh, the, the, the salinity because there's a direct relationship between electrical conductivity and the total concentration of salts in the solution. But what there is is important to talk about is the relationship between that of the irrigation water and that of the soil, saturated soil extract. The ECE is the, set, is the electrical conductivity of the saturated soil extract. The way that is determined is soil samples are collected from the field in various locations to characterize the active root zone. They're brought back to the laboratory, dried, ground, and distilled water is added to, this, 
the soil sample to the point where it's completely saturated. It's usually left to sit overnight and then it's extracted and in that, that extraction, that, uh, that filtrate is then used to measure the electroconductivity. The reason why this term is important is because all the plant uh, tolerance uh, parameters are all related to this ECE. Now, salt affects tree crops in performance in different ways. The two general ways it affects it is called osmotic effects and specific ion effects. And specific ion effects can be broken into two different components. One where those specific ions in the irrigation water or the soil water are high enough to actually produce ion toxicities uh, in the crop. The other is uh, more subtle, generally, it's uh, nutritional disorders, is that the, the ratio of different ions in the solution is such that it can produce um, ion uh, deficiencies. Now here's just a, a, a cartoon schematic of an osmotic effect. Generally, plants, uh, either tree crops or any other crops, they tend to like to take up water uh, way more than any of the mineral salts in the soil solution. So basically, the, most of them take up water and they leave the salts behind. Now, what happens though is when the soil, the salt concentration in the soil solution start to increase to a certain point, then for the plant to be able to get that water away from the salt, it's got to be able to accumulate uh, solutes inside the root cells. And to do this, it requires energy on the, on the plant, uh, part of the plant. And so those plants that are, tend to be more tolerant to salinity are much more effective at uh, essentially uh, being able to adjust themselves osmotically to the solution. Ones that are more sensitive are, are less efficient at doing this. So the general osmotic effects is that if you go from non-saline to moderately saline to high saline, plants, plant growth is essentially stunted. They become smaller and smaller. So in other, uh, all other aspects, the plant would look healthy. It's just that the plants now just become stunted. The literature has uh, compiled um, salt tolerance guidelines to look at the yield potential of different crops to increase in salinity. This diagram shows selected uh, tree crops that show as the salinity of the, of the, of the root zone expresses the average root zone salinity or the saturated soil, soil extract. As it increases in the soil solution, you hit this value which we call a, a threshold beyond which yields begin to get reduced. Now the ones that tend to be more sensitive is they have a lower threshold and a much steeper slope of decline. For example, you can see that almonds, peach, and plum all are fairly sensitive or some of the more sensitive tree crops. What this suggests is that if your average root zone salinity reaches around four decisiemens per meter, you can expect your yield potential to only be half that it would be under a non-saline condition. Now you can see some other crops like uh, olive, grape, and date palm are substantially more tolerant. So how do we keep this salinity to, uh, from building up to damaging levels? Well, it's important to talk about leaching. And the, the way we bring up leaching, uh, we use a term which we call the leaching fraction. The leaching fraction is basically the amount of water applied to the soil and infiltrated into the soil surface uh, and that drained below. So the leaching fraction is that fraction of water that drains below versus that that infiltrates in, the, in above. For example, if you have a pot at home and you take a cup of water and you dump it onto the top of the pot and you catch a quarter cup of water below, then essentially your leaching fraction is 25%. Now this diagram shows that if you have the same EC of the irrigation water, but you have different leaching fractions, what would you expect the soil profile to look like in terms of salt accumulation? If you assume that the crop root zone is broken down into quarters, now this could either be, this whole root zone could be either one foot or it could be four feet. It doesn't really matter, but the pattern is, is that generally the top quarter of the root system takes up about 40% uh, of, of the crop evapotranspiration, the next quarter 30%, then 20 and then 10. And if you use this kind of relationship, you get these types of relationships here 
whereas the salinity in the profile increases with increasing depth. Now notice the red line versus that of the white line. The red line illustrates a low leaching fraction. In other words, as you increase, um, as you decrease the, the leaching fraction, less water is draining below that pot, the salinity increases at a much uh, faster rate than it would be if that same salinity of the water was applied with a higher leaching fraction. So here, the average root zone salinity is much lower than it is over here. Now taking a similar example, except now we're using two different salinities, this is being the EC of the water, let's say at 0.7, and a higher salinity being at about 1.2. If this a, a higher salinity is applied at a higher leaching fraction and this lower salinity is at a lower leaching fraction, the two can result in pretty much the same average root zone salinity. So in other words, the, the, you would expect the, the yield uh, potential to be the same under this condition as well as this, this higher salinity of the water. Now it's important to talk about in terms of is, is salt movement and, and uh, deposition in, uh, in the soil. This is a diagram showing a tree crop here and you can see these big white circles here suggesting that you get these big rings of salt accumulation uh, with distance away from the emitter. Now it's important to bring out this number one as you can easily see that there's salt accumulating on the soil surface but it's also important to notice that in the soil solution, some of the really damaging salts are very soluble, and you may not see evidence of, of, of salt deposition on the soil surface to the same extent as you would with a lot of calcium salts that can precipitate out and be very reflective and very vis vi visual. So therefore, it's really critical that at different times of the year, soil samples are collected at various points in the root system to figure out what the salinity is. Here's a diagram showing um, a, a buried drip system to give you a better idea of the salt accumulation patterns. This white circle illustrates a drip line that comes in and out of the screen. And what this shows that is if you start off at a very dry profile, then you get these wetting patterns that are essentially cylindrical wetting patterns at distances um, away from this drip line. And close to the drip line, this darker blue area, you can see that the salinity is much lower than it is as water advances out in all directions away from the drip tubing. As water moves away from the drip tubing, the roots extract the pure water, leaving the salts behind, and as a result, the concentration salts start accumulating with distances away from the drip line, as it does in this illustration. So in other words, here you can see that the concentration of salts increase both with depth as well as horizontal direction. Now here's another diagram that shows two different drip lines, but now the profile's already wet. So what happens when you irrigate an already wet profile um, and, and uh, trying to, to see exactly where, where the salts are, are concentrating? Well, in this illustration, it shows that the salinity is actually fairly low directly under the drip lines, but as you move away from the drip lines in both directions, you can see that salinity accumulates. Again, this is kind of shows you those rings I showed you, the picture of the, of the, of the orchards where you can see the white circles around uh, by the trees. Again, that's away from the drip line to get the salts to accumulate. But so this shows two things. Number one is leaching fraction is much higher direct, directly below the root system, whereas the leaching fraction is a lot lower or, or essentially almost zero as you move in this direction. This same type of behavior is also seen with mini sprinklers. These little stars illustrate mini sprinklers in a particular orchard. As you can see, the value here in the gray illustrates very low salinity directly around the soil around the, the mini sprinklers. But as you move distance away, for example, in between the two different uh, uh, mini sprinklers, you can see that the maximum salinity begins to build. Now it's important to talk about ion toxicity. Ion toxicity in tree crop production is very, very important. There's three different types of constituents that are particularly problematic to, to ion toxicity. One is boron, and the other is chloride, and the other is sodium. Now these are the two salts, uh, salt ions that tend to be most problematic. 
Now, just a quick word about boron. Boron is one of those elements that's required for plant production, but it has a really small concentration window between what the plant needs versus to what is toxic. And once boron's introduced into the soil, it's very difficult to remove out by leaching. Um, chloride and, and so sodium toxicity, on the other hand, can accumulate and be transported up to the leaves and produce injury. So how does this actually happen? In the soil water, I mentioned that plants generally like to take water up and, and, and leave the salts behind, but they can accumulate certain amounts of salts, both uh, sodium and chloride, into the root tissue, and it can trans go up, up through the transpirational stream and accumulate in the leaves. One of the things that's very characteristic of salt injury in orchards is that the injury first shows up on the oldest leaves and in particular on the margins and the tips of the oldest leaves. Why? Because this is the, those particular leaves uh, have had the most amount of water that's transpired through them versus the younger tissues. Here's a, a, a typical type of injury pattern that's tip, very typical of salt burn. It's very difficult to look at the leaf and try to understand whether this is a sodium uh, toxicity or chloride toxicity. A lot of times in chloride toxicity, you do get this area where you have necrosis and then a transitional area of uh, um, chl uh, chlorosis in between the necrosis and the healthier tissue, but not in all cases. It's only, you, the important thing is that the leaf samples would have to be collected and then brought back to the, to the laboratory to get an idea of, of whether toxicity is occurring. When leaf samples are collected, it's important that, that uh, leaf samples are collected from the oldest leaves, which would represent the, uh, the area where you have the most salt accumulation, as well as the younger tissue, which would be the least level, the least amount of uh, salt accumulation. So what are some general guidelines? If you take these leaf samples uh, back, to, uh, back to get analyzed, and the sodium and the chloride concentrations is less than 0.25 for the sodium and less than 0.3% for the chloride expressed on a dry weight basis, then typically you don't see much burning occurring in the orchards. You start getting a slight to moderate burns when you see the value start edging up from 0.25 to 0.5%. Uh, and then once they exceed 0.5, you can have moderate to very severe burn. Now, again, these are very general guidelines. And the point, and the reason is, is that the leaf may actually have values that are actually higher than 0.5% and appear healthy until you have a really hot, dry, desiccating condition that can come by and that those leaves that have already values that are above this 0.5 would immediately uh, show injury. Now tree crops are interesting in the sense that the rootstock generally is the one that controls the amount of, of salts that get in um, into the cyan. So in other words, you could have the same plum cultivar, the same almond, uh, uh, almond cultivar or whatever on the top, but its tolerance will be dependent upon what the different rootstock is below. And a tolerant rootstock typically does not take up salts. It excludes it and keeps it away from the, from the cyan. A sensitive rootstock, on the other hand, will accumulate this particular salt, sodium and chloride, transport it up, and then injury can occur on those older leaves. Do we know any kind of values in terms of uh, chloride toxicity uh, for, different, for different tree crops? Well, here's a general guideline for chloride tolerance for various uh, prunus rootstocks. These are older rootstocks, but nevertheless, this illustrates the importance of what root, how the rootstock can influence uh, uh, leaf injury. These values here represent the, the maximum concentration beyond which injury will start to occur. So in other words, if chloride of the saturated soil extract is around uh, 890 uh, milligrams per liter, above that one can expect to see injury in the Mariana, whereas Yemen values only as high as uh, 265 and above could start producing injury. These values here represent, re represent the same, same thing except it's expressed as the irrigation water. And here we assume that the leaching fraction is around 15 to 20 percent. And if you have that, then this is the relationship between the irrigation water concentration and the saturated soil extract concentration. Now, experiment by David Dahl uh, in 2013 uh, started looking at some more of the more uh, popular cultivars of almond 
And what they found is that a couple of the cultivars like Bright's and Hansen um, accumulate substantially less sodium and chloride than do those same, uh, same uh, varieties, either Carmel or non pareil grafted on top of uh, Halford uh, level Nemagard and Nema Red. In other words, when these particular um, almonds are grafted on these more tolerant rootstocks, the plants are a lot more tolerant because the salt is excluded. So therefore, Bright's and Hansen appear to be much more tolerant rootstocks than these other, other almond rootstocks. Now, it's also important to talk about both the osmotic effects and specific ion effects over time. Typically, uh, the general idea is that osmotic effects dominate at early times, but as the tree moves, uh, gets older and older, then specific ion and, and, and osmotic effects uh, both are, are, can be res equally responsible, but in the later years, specific ion toxicity can be the one that's really causing most of the damage. Now, sometimes it's typically looked at as chloride toxicity to often is, is the culprit, but not always. For example, here's an example of, of um, a, a mechanism of sodium toxicity. This is done by uh, some research uh, way back in 1956 by Leon Bernstein and also here at Davis by Catlin. And what this is showing is that certain cultivars can accumulate sodium and accumulates in the roots and in the trunks. But then as this sapwood later gets converted to hardwood, maybe after a few, three to four years, then a lot of that sodium can then be released and brought up into the, into, into the tissue and cause injury. So a lot of research hasn't really been done on this to understand exactly what it, what it is that causes this type of injury. But this release of sodium has been observed in the literature as a way of causing uh, injury in the tree. Now, it, it used to be believed that, that, um, you know, that, that calcium, uh, in fact, the early, earlier scientists weren't, weren't really aware that calcium, what the importance it was in terms of, of, of keeping uh, sodium, uh, essentially that tree's toxic effect of sodium down. In other words, calcium is really important in stabilizing the root membrane, just as calcium is very important in stabilizing the soil aggregates. So the membrane uh, is stabilized and that lets them to be a lot more selective in taking in what type of ions the, the, that gets moved into the cell versus the types of ions that get excluded. With, with not adequate amounts of calcium, this selectivity cannot occur. Sodium selectivity to crops is more likely related to the sodium to calcium ratio really than the, whole, than the actual sodium concentration. In fact, Bob Ayers and, and Dennis Westcott in their 1985 uh, book, um, Water Quality for Agriculture, uh, produced by FAO, they suggest that sodium is not a problem unless the um, SAR exceeds uh, th three. In other words, it's not going to be a problem if the SAR is less than three. So now I just want to kind of summarize some of the, the key take-home points to this presentation. First of all, almonds uh, grown on peach almond hybrid rootstocks appear they have higher tolerance to salinity than those in the peach, peach rootstocks. In other words, those that are on the Brights or the Hansen tend to be a lot more tolerant than the others. The most notorious toxic ions are both chloride and sodium, but it's not easy to see to make a distinction between a chloride toxicity and a sodium toxicity. Injury often becomes more severe over time, and rootstocks that are able to keep excessive amounts of sodium and chloride from entering the cyan are much more tolerant than those that readily take it up and translocate it to the scion. Now it's also important to take water samples, soil samples, and leaf tissues at various times during the season so you can monitor to see whether the salinity is actually increasing to these critical levels that I presented earlier. If saline water is used, um, it's important not to let the whole soil profile dry out. Under drought situations, you can have a perfect storm being created. Number one, you've got a sensitive tree crop, a, a crop that's you know, sensitive to salinity. You've got a situation where under drought conditions you didn't have uh, enough winter rainfall to leach out the profile, and you have to now rely on well water, which typically has higher salinity than a lot of the surface water supplies. So if you have that combination, plus you induce a drought stress on top of it, those, th that's, that combination of situations can make the perfect storm for having a really disastrous situation. So it's important 
to keep um, the soil profile wet. And also, it's important to leach the profile during the winter as much as possible during that low evaporative demand or leach the profile whenever salts acu accumulate to this critical level. Now again, I'm, I'm located at UC Davis, and at the beginning of the presentation, I gave my email address, which I welcome any questions for any of you should have to, to, to get any kind of discussion in more detail. My email address is S, S is in Steve, R is in Robert, and the last name Grattan, G-R-A-T-T-A-N at ucdavis.edu. Thank you.